Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is Ryan, five-year expat here in Africa. Come join me uh, as I walk through the village here. Yeah, this is just a typical thing that I see every day, dirt roads. It's like a town, but in a jungle. So today I want to talk about some experiences that I've had in Africa that I think will help me in life and will definitely help me when I'm not living in Africa. So when I first came to Uganda, I hired somebody actually to help me find a place to live, to teach me the ins and outs of how to do the simplest things like take a boda from point A to B, how to buy food. I mean, just things that you take for granted in your everyday life in your home country. I had to relearn everything, how to do it here in Uganda. You might think it's easy, but it's not. You'll be very confused and you'll get ripped off and you have a lot of trouble. So I basically paid this person to teach me everything and also to help me find a place to live. Because when I first got to Uganda, I was staying in a hotel and paying a lot of money every night. So after a long day of looking at apartments and houses, uh, we went back to her house where her mom had made dinner for us. And I had dinner with uh, her and her family. And we're sitting down and we're eating some very local Ugandan food. I mean, just simple stuff like rice and vegetables and uh, uh, yam and cassava. Typical Ugandan food, just kind of bland and not very tasty, but that's that's how they live out here. Very simple. It's a good diet, by the way. You know, it keeps you healthy. Uh, no additives, no sugar, no you know, no unhealthy food. So we're sitting there on the floor eating dinner with our hands. It was a very nice experience. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see something dart through the kitchen and into the tup where the Tupperware and the glasses were. And it, it was a rat. And I was just horrified and surprised and shocked at the same time. And I I told the girl and her mom, I said, "There's you, you got a mouse in your kitchen. They kind of glanced back and then they just looked back at their food again and, and continued eating like, like it was no big deal. And I just couldn't believe their reaction. And I said, uh, you know, it's uh, this could be dangerous for you. You could, the, the rat can spread some disease. It can get on your dishes and you you accidentally eat it and you can get sick. And and the girl said, yeah, yeah, well, you're right. Uh, you're right about that. But she, <laughs> she didn't offer any kind of solution for her own situation. So, you know, that, that was my first few weeks in, in Uganda. Uh, but as I lived here over the years, uh, I've seen that it's almost impossible to keep rats and mice out of your living space. It's quite common. I saw it in every place that I've lived. And even when I go to other people's houses to see a rat or a mouse in a shop, in a restaurant, uh, in somebody's house, it's quite common, and I've just gotten used to it. However, I did find a really good solution that most Ugandans don't know about, how to deal with rats and mice in your house, and that's dogs. Uh, once I taught my dogs the word mouse, they would come inside, I would say, mouse, get the mouse, and I would point to where I last saw the mouse, and they would hunt that sucker, and they would find it, and they would catch it. And they got so good at it that uh, rats and mice were no longer even coming into the house. They would kill them before they even got to the house. Once in a while, a big rat would get in and we'd have a big hunt. And um, no rat ever survived, unfortunately. There was one that survived. I There was a big storm one morning and I went to the toilet to take a dump. I'm about to sit down on the toilet and I see something out of the corner of my eye squiggling around in the toilet water. I looked in there and there was a big rat coming up through the pipe, the toilet pipe into the toilet, but he couldn't climb out of the toilet. His head was just sticking out of the water. Looked like he had been there, you know, probably gotten washed up from the septic tank. And it looked like he had just been stranded there for the last few hours. The poor guy didn't have any energy. And I know most people would say, yeah, put bleach in the toilet and kill it or just flush it back down the toilet. But I just, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it. You know, when my dogs killed the rats, it would just be like one bite to the neck and, and the rat would die. It was a very humane way to, to get rid of the rat. 
but in this situation I couldn't I didn't feel I could kill it humanely so I got a box and I used the toilet scrubber and I somehow cajoled the rat into the box poor little guy couldn't couldn't barely move I mean he must have been in there for hours got him out into the box and I put him in a field and he just he just laid there and I went back a couple hours and he was gone so he must have survived anyways I got used to rats and and mice and just seeing it in everyday life um still don't want them in my house but it's like i'm not freaked out about them like i used to be i, I was renting a big house uh, it's a four bedroom two bathroom had a guest house on the property really nice place uh, but after that i moved in i transitioned to just a one-room place kind of in a ghetto area there was about 10 units in this compound with different uh people living in each unit and we all shared a bathroom so i mean this is a really cheap place it was a 40 dollars a month rent uh, we all shared a bathroom and it was a squat toilet and the room was real simple just about 12 feet by 12 feet a concrete floor rain would seep up from the soil into the concrete i didn't know that concrete was porous but of course you know, they, they build so cheaply and and with lack of knowledge here um, that they didn't waterproof the concrete. So when it rained, water would seep up through the floor. You're living in a small room, no toilet. Uh, you Every time I would go to the bathroom, I would have to uh, put on some decent clothes, walk out my door, close my door, lock my door. Then I needed the key to the public bathroom. I would go there, unlock that lock, go inside, close the door, do do what I need to do, take a shower, go to the bathroom. You know, it was a, it was a big production every time I wanted to use the bathroom. And it was it was terrible when I got sick. I would just sometimes just use a basin, you know, like if when I was sick, when I got food poisoning, I would just vomit, have diarrhea in a basin. Sorry for the <laughs> graphic nature of this story, but it's, it's that was part of my life here, getting sick, living in a 12 by 12 room with a porous concrete floor. You know, having food poisoning, vomiting, diarrhea every 10 minutes, I mean, it it was an experience. Um, but at that time, I had a girlfriend who, she did her best to take care of me in that situation. And, you know, I'm, I'm here talking like, oh, I was suffering. It was so horrible. But the reality is, is that's how a majority of the Ugandans live. They, they live that way. And even in worse conditions, you know, there's people who live in houses that don't even have a concrete floor. Um, the walls may be made of wood and the, when it rains the wood shrinks and there's gaps in the walls and rainwater can come in and they don't have enough money to make a concrete floor so it's just they're living on a dirt floor i, I experienced that and i i feel like if i could live in that kind of environment i could pretty much live in any environment uh, especially in a developed country or a first world country i think if you can stand and tolerate kind of the, the toughest things in life. After you go through that, life is a breeze. There was another time uh, where I was living out in the bush, you know, very rural place. Um, I had to stay with a family for a couple weeks to take care of some business. They lived in a place where there was no electricity, no running water, and no sewage. Uh, they had an outhouse, and to take a, sh to take a shower, you know, you'd, uh, we'd either have to use rainwater that they collected, if they didn't have uh, rainwater, then the kids would go to a well and pump water from a well into big jerry cans. And those jerry cans get really heavy when they're full. And the kids haul these things back to the house. And then you pour water in a basin. And you go to the outhouse and there's a little concrete floor with a drain. And you just pour cold water over yourself. And at the end of the day, after living out in the bush, uh, believe me, you are dirty everywhere. You feel sweaty. You can feel the dirt on you. You just feel disgusting. And it's so nice and refreshing to just take a a big scoop of water and pour it over yourself and just to feel that dirt and sweat come off your body. It's such an invigorating feeling. And you're you're out there in the middle of the jungle. You know, you got critters and animal all kinds of animals out there and crickets and bugs and you're you're out there and with the open sky pouring cold water over yourself it's a it's a really 
it's like camping pretty much. Uh, but it's nice. It's an interesting experience. But it does get tiring. I was there uh, for a couple weeks. And I, I actually I go back every week and stay a few nights once in a while. And it really, like I, th- I thought that living in a 12 by 12 foot room with a garage like concrete floor was tough. I would, I would feel so happy to come back to that place after being in the bush. I've lived here without internet. When the the current president, who's now been president for I think over thirty five years, well, during the last elections, uh, he didn't like the outside world uh, commenting about rigged elections and you know fair like democratic process of presidential presidential elections. So he didn't want to hear any anybody's opinions, and uh, he just turned off the internet for the whole country. And so for a whole week, no internet. No, it wasn't even possible to have internet. And the first day, the first day I felt really anxious about it. I couldn't contact anybody, couldn't contact my family and friends overseas. And I was really stressed about it. But around day two two or three, uh, this great sense of peace came over me. I fortunately had downloaded a few books onto my smartphone and um, I would spend a few hours every afternoon just reading. Other than that, I would go on long walks with my dogs and just spend time with my girlfriend and, and then do the other necessary things for living like shopping for food, cooking, cleaning. And some nights we didn't have electricity there either and we would just uh, be there by candlelight and I would read and not being dependent on the internet, it, it was wonderful. I mean, think about your own life. When is the last time you spent more than 24 or 48 hours without the internet? Uh, yeah, at first there was, I had a little bit of anxiety about it. But after a week, I realized what a true blessing it was. I mean, it, it was just wonderful. It was like a spiritual reset. Now, it's really hard to do that if you actually do have access to the internet. It's really hard to have that willpower not to use it. But that was a good experience. Another thing you have to be aware of, uh, when I'm here, I'm always just constantly thinking about my security. Um, Not so much when I go outside on walks like you see here in the video, but if you've ever been to like Latin America, for example, or Mexico, you see all the houses have metal bars over the windows. Well, it's the same here in Africa. Um, people are opportunists, and uh, you know if they think you have some money, you're going to be a target. So I'm just always careful about locking my door, who's watching me, and that kind of stuff. But it's, I just have to be more aware of it. So before I came to Africa, I used to be like really empathetic, and everybody who approached me and talked to me and told me about their problems. I would listen empathetically and I would actually care and I didn't want to hurt their feelings and I would actually internalize their sad stories and feel bad about it and I would feel like I was obligated or that I even wanted to help in some way. But I, uh, people here just, uh, I, I, I realized after some time that I was just a target. I started to think, you know, okay, you're telling me your sad story. You're telling me about your sick mother or your sick grandmother or, you know, somebody, some relative who's in the hospital. But somehow you managed to live all 28 years of your life without me. Uh, so I think you can continue on without my help. And I had to take that kind of tough guy, non-negotiable, non-negotiable mentality. I had to just stop caring. I mean, I care, but I just I just had to draw the line, stop internalizing other people's problems as much, feeling that I had to provide a solution. That's that's what it was. I always I always felt that I had to provide a solution because I thought that if I didn't, I would feel guilty. I mean, I would feel guilty. And that's how I changed mentally. I stopped feeling guilty and I stopped feeling sorry for people. And I started to think, well, you know, you're responsible for your problems. I'm only one man. And first of all, I've got to help myself and I've got to survive here. 
So I'm, I'm not in a position to help you. So I've seen, uh, I've seen people here just living very meagerly and humbly and people who have almost nothing. You'll see people living, can't even call it a house really. It might be boards nailed together. You know, a place that looks like it was built, built by a 12-year-old dirt floor. You'll see families living on literally a couple dollars a day. Kids uh, wearing raggedy clothes, secondhand clothes, no shoes. But somehow they persevere. When I go back to my home country and uh, I see homeless people or people begging me for money, I just I can't feel sorry for them. I, I can't. I feel sorry for the people here in Uganda because there's very little opportunity there's very little help from the government. If you're poor here, you're on your own. You know, your family might help you out if they can, but usually they can't. You really got to take on the, all the burdens of the world by yourself. But in developed countries, as long as you're staying off drugs, you don't have a mental illness, uh, you have your mind, your arms and your legs, you can work. There are programs, there's government assistance, there's ways out. So I'm sorry, I, I just can't respect people in this highly developed country who have all the opportunities in the world and they want to stand out there and beg. I mean, if they only knew how people here in Africa live and despite the hardships they have, they persevere, they work hard. You ever notice how a lot of immigrants come to America and they go for higher education, graduate degrees, uh, they get good jobs, a lot of them come and they pull their money together with, from their family and they start businesses and they do well here. And that's because they know what's back home, whatever country they came from, whatever third world country they came from. All they can see is opportunity. And then you have these fat, lazy, taking everything for granted Americans. Their families have been here for years and generations. And all they do is complain and see how the system is against them. I bet if they spent a year or five years in Africa, they'd have a different view too.